So we're now ready to start. Um, make yourself comfortable. Uh, this session will go for an hour. It may be a little shorter if we cover up everything um, that we're intending to do. Hopefully we will. Um, and if you are having trouble hearing, um, there's directions in your email. Um, and if you've got any questions, the number to call is 03 If you can't see a web camera, um, I apologise for this. Uh, because of the number of people that we've had um, that are logging in this evening, which is very exciting, uh, we didn't want to overload the system, so um, we're going to go with our web cameras just so we have clarity of sound and clarity of picture. Um, so we had all done our makeup girls, all, all pretty, and you won't be able to see us tonight, um, but we might have a photo or two so you get a little bit of a visual feel of who you're talking to. So we'll get started. Um, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the support of um, our partner in delivering this webinar. Fiona Callum from the Lou Cancer Centre, um, and I'll bring up our wonderful guest speaker, which I'll introduce shortly. Breast Cancer Network Australia, the health professionals and patients that helped us shape this webinar, our uh, Cancer Council in all states, and of course other supporting organisations that deliver uh, supportive care to the community. We'll start with a little housekeeping. Um, the participant lines and microphones are muted, so hopefully you can hear us, but we can't hear you, just to, uh, again, have that clarity of sound and so we can't hear any chatter or kids in the background. Um, if you are having any uh, questions or problems, please call 03 9635 and the girls in the support team will help you out there. We have had a last minute change of speaker. Uh, as Mary Ann um, has come down our well, but we are equally blessed to have the wonderful Lucinda Gossack, who is also very experienced and, and also comes to us from Peter Mac Familiar Camp, Familiar Camp, thank you, that's a bit of a, uh, <laughs> your mouth like. Um, so we welcome um, Lucinda and we trust that she will do a wonderful job. Um, it's important to know um, who this webinar is for and what we can and cannot cover this evening. Tonight's webinar is for people who are unsure or confused about the risk of breast cancer due to a family history and for those who do not know what the risk factors are for breast cancer. If you have been diagnosed with BRCA1 and or BRCA2 or at a high risk of breast cancer by a family genetic cancer centre, although this discussion this evening might interest you and you are more than welcome to stay online with us, we appreciate that this group has a separate set of issues and needs Thus, we will endeavour to hold a separate webinar for you in the near future. If you registered for this webinar and selected the box to indicate you are a carrier of BRCA1 at all and or BRCA2, you will receive an email about this in coming weeks. It's also important to note that our webinar provides general advice only and is not an alternative to seeking medical advice. Due to the complex nature of genetic history and cancer, we may not be able to answer all of your questions tonight. However, we should, in most cases, be able to, to direct you to the appropriate healthcare professional or service. Please also be aware that information and services may vary from state to state, and may also differ considerably if you're logging in from another country, which we've had a few international guests, so very welcome to you. We will send an email this evening with all of the resources we refer to, so please don't worry about trying to download as they come up because um, you'll get those all in an email. Finally, if you have been diagnosed with cancer and have questions about any type or stage of cancer, please call the Cancer Cancer Helpline Monday to Friday 9am to 5pm on 13 11 20 in your individual state. So we're now going to move on to the format of the evening and um, we'll start off um, with a presentation from our guest speaker, Lucinda Hossack. Uh, we will then move on to some Q&A, um, which were pre-submitted by people when they are registering. And then we'll also highlight additional support services and evaluation 
um, link. Uh, for those with burning questions, please type them into the chat box and there will be an opportunity for those to be answered individually, if not tonight, uh, in the following day. Again, if you're having trouble connecting in, um, please have a look at this slide that I've got up here um, and call the number at the bottom of the screen. But everyone seems to be um, on board quite easily, which is a great state. So why are we having a webinar? A little bit of background, so I think the thing is also going to highlight shortly. Um, in Australia, one in nine women will develop breast cancer before the age of 85. Ovarian cancer is not as common, and one in 78 women will develop ovarian cancer in their lifetime. For most of these women, cancer will not occur until after menopause, and usually for reasons unrelated to an inherited um, predisposition to breast cancer. A small number of women, only 5 to 8 percent, at most 10 percent in all cases, will have an inherited predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer. Thus, it's important to note that a more significant factor is lifestyle choices, and we found um, that a third of cancers can be prevented by making uh, better lifestyle um, choices, which Rosinda will also touch on in her presentation. The reason we decided to hold this webinar is because we were quite overwhelmed with um, community concern about um, genetic testing and how uh, breast cancer can be linked to your family history. And we had um, many calls to health homes across Australia um, with women and men that were concerned about themselves or family members. Uh, so we decided to hold a webinar to reach a large number of people, which we have over 500 people logged in tonight. So um, obviously, uh, people responded and um, reached them in those regional and rural areas to make sure that they had access to the information they needed and make sure the evidence, uh, this information was evidence based. So, ladies and men, if you don't have a bride to support you, um, sorry, tonight is stuck with us. So, we'll try our best to uh, meet your needs and answer your questions. I'll now introduce Lucinda. She has nine years experience as a clinical genetic counsellor. She currently works at Peter Mack at Cancer Centre. She works to help families understand how their family history of cancer impacts on their personal and close family members' cancer risk. And she, on a daily basis, informs individuals and families about the options available to manage um, to detect cancer early or reduce cancer risk. Lucinda has Two beautiful little girls that are up on your screen right now, Poppy and Josephine, and she likes reading and spending time with her family, especially her husband, the two girls and friends. Carol Arbuckle will also be supporting with Cinder this evening, and she's an experienced oncology and palliative care nurse specialist. She's worked on our Cancer Council helpline uh, at Cancer Council Victoria for over six years. She has special interest in providing reliable evidence-based internet information for people with cancer and also a specialty in talking to people about body image and relationship changes after cancer. Uh, I asked Carol to share what she likes to do in her spare time and she said she's quite entertained by cat videos on the internet. So she's laughing beside me. Myself, uh, I'm the Communications Manager of the Cancer Information Support Team. Uh, our team produces the booklets, the fact sheets and the online resources that some of you may have come across um, in your journey. Um, I also, like Carol, have a special interest in creating online spaces for people to connect and feel supported no matter where they live, so for those rural and regionally. Um, for me, I grew up in Ocean Grove uh, in a family of all kids. Um, you can see our four kids there with mum and dad. Um, and I am now a wedding celebrant on the weekend, so that, that keeps me busy. Um, we just thought we'd touch on the support services available to you. If you do have questions after um, tonight's session, uh, the can Council help on uh, by calling 13 11 20. Uh, that will connect you to your local state. No matter where you are in Australia, you'll uh, get evidence-based information, you can ask questions, share concerns, and we have um, experienced cat nurses on the line, so you're in the best care. We also run at Cancer Council a genetic peer support program, so if you would be interested um, in exploring that further, it allows you to talk to someone that's been through a similar experience, um, and, and I guess share, 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 share your experience and um, your story. 
Uh, also, Cancer Australia, um, and we will send you all these links this evening. Uh, Pink Heart, Breast Cancer Network Australia, and OECAM, as well as some other resources that we're going to touch on. I'm now going to hand over to Lucinda, who is going to uh, give you a presentation on breast cancer in my family, what does it mean for me? Um, and Carol will be supporting uh, Lucinda throughout. The girls are also there if you've got any questions that you need to chat at in the chat box. They will uh, respond to those, but uh, be assured that hopefully uh, in the next 40 minutes we'll, we'll cover off many of those. So we'll pass on to the and welcome. Thank you, Jess. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to help sort of broaden people's knowledge about what family history um, of cancer means. And also, how does genetics really fit into that in terms of what does it really tell us about our risk and, and like how we can manage that? So, as Jeff actually um, explained very nicely previously, breast cancer is one of the most common cancers affecting women here in Australia. And about one in nine women do develop breast cancer at the age of, uh, up to the age of 85. As just said, for most women, cancer will not occur until after menopause, and this usually is for reasons unrelated to a family history of cancer or familial reasons. A small number of women, however, will have a risk of developing breast and or ovarian cancer due to their family history. Generally, it is not possible for us to really know why it is that women develop breast cancer, and particularly for an individual woman, what it, what it is that has caused them to develop breast cancer. However, from our research, um, and the many research studies that have occurred internationally, looking at very large numbers of women, we now understand some of the characteristics that are more common in groups of women who have developed breast cancer when compared to groups of women who have not developed cancer. And we term these factors risk factors. Different cancers have different risk factors. For instance, well, um, many of us are aware that exposure to strong sunlight is a risk factor for melanoma, and many of us are now also aware of the uh, risks posed by smoking, in particular for cancers of the lung, mouth, larynx, bladder, kidney, and also for several other cancers, organs. Some risk factors we have no control over, and some risk factors we do have control over. When we think about breast cancer, risk factors that can increase our risk of breast cancer include being a woman, and this is evident by the fact that men develop breast cancer at lower rates than women do. Age is also a risk factor for breast cancer. We know that the average age of women developing breast cancer in our community is around 60 years of age. And we also know that 75% of women who develop breast cancer do develop breast cancer at ages over the age of 60. It is possible for young women to develop breast cancer, but on the whole, the majority of women do so at an age over the age of 50. We also understand now that weight gain, particularly after menopause, is also a risk factor for breast cancer. There are also some other factors that we now understand in terms of their, um, how they contribute to breast cancer risk. And some of these are related to our hormones, our menstrual history, the way in which our breasts are made up in, the, in terms of the tissue components, and also lifestyle factors as well. Things like when we start breast uh, so when we start um, our periods and when we finish our periods, whether we've had children or not, as well as whether we've used um, uh, medications or replacement therapies such as hormone replacement therapy, all have a risk in terms of um, contributing to breast cancer. We also understand that for women who live in more affluent areas do have a slight increased risk for breast cancer, and we think this probably relates to perhaps lifestyle differences in terms of the way in which women live their lives. Drinking alcohol, the alcohol intake is now quite clear in terms of its relationship to increasing breast cancer risk for women who have more than two to five centimetres daily. And breast density, which refers to essentially um, 
the amount of fatty tissue in which is um, in which the breast is made up of. So for women who have very little fatty tissue in their breast, this is called uh, or termed dense breast, and we know that that also has a relationship in terms of slightly increasing the risk of breast cancer for those women. For some women, and this is not common, but for some women, they may have a prior history of breast changes such as nodular cancer in situ or atypical hyperplasia, and these, um, the, well, these breast um, changes we know also have a relationship to increasing the risk of women, of breast cancer for those particular women. So family history, how does this all relate in terms of people's breast cancer risk? We know that um, as breast cancer is so common, many women who develop breast cancer will have a family history. However, um, despite the importance of family history as a risk factor, eight out of nine women who develop breast cancer don't have a close relative being a mother, sister or daughter who have breast cancer in addition to themselves. Having a family history of breast cancer doesn't mean there is a high risk for other women in the family developing breast cancer and is dependent on several factors. So what are the things that we look for that can influence the risk of breast cancer in a family? The things that are important are a number of family members affected by breast cancer, the ages at which those relatives are affected, how close those relatives are in relation to their relationship to, to you, as well as whether there is a history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and male breast cancer. Another important risk factor, and sorry, we're just having a few technical difficulties with the slides. Mm -hmm. That's what we're up to here. Uh, we're up to 20, slide 23. Sorry, guys, we'll get our back on track in a minute. Mm -hmm. Next slide, I'm on again. That's it. Um, and the last factor can also be um, the ancestral background um, that a family comes from. In particular, we know that having an ancestral background um, or, or families from an Ashkenazi Jewish um, ancestral uh, background can have an increased um, likelihood of there being a hereditary component to the family history of breast cancer. A strong family history of cancer is essentially um, where we see one or more of the features that I've talked about above. The senior person's learned to increase breast cancer risk and can be passed down through a mother and a father. Therefore, a father's family history is important um, for us to consider in relation to the possible um, presence of a hereditary gene in a family. Breast or ovarian cancer can be caused by inheriting a faulty gene, and this is what we mean by hereditary cancer. We all inherit a set of genes from our parents, and sometimes there is a fault in one copy of that gene that stops it from working properly, and this fault is called a mutation. There are several gene mutations that may be involved in the development of breast or ovarian cancer. But the most common mutations are in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. About 5 to 10 percent of all breast cancers are caused by inherited gene mutations, for which currently testing is available. The two most common genes are BRCA1 and 2. As I said, we all have these genes, and the role of these genes is normally to prevent a woman from developing breast or ovarian cancer. However, when one has a faulty copy of that gene caused by gene mutation, it means that those genes can't provide the same level of, protect, of protection against those cancers as someone with two working copies, and that in itself increases the risk of a woman developing breast cancer. So how do we know that one of these genes is in a family? Well, first of all, we assess the family history, and for families that are deemed to be eligible for genetic testing, um, a familial cancer centre can provide that in some settings um, at no cost to the patient. The eligibility criteria is such that individuals have to have a high, the families have to have a high likelihood of a BRCA1 or 2 gene alteration, and this is often um, this is often caused by or in the presence of a strong family history, as well as the family. For some women, the presence of specific types of breast cancer, or what we call pathology of breast cancer. When a 
genetic test is conducted, we take a blood sample and the first instance from a family member who has had breast or ovarian cancer. That blood sample is looked at and we in particular assert the genetic information or DNA, DNA for a gene alteration or mutation. It is a complex test and it's a little bit like searching for a spelling mistake in an encyclopedia. If a mutation is found, we can offer testing to other family members to see whether they have or have not inherited that gene mutation and that provides us with a lot of certainty about whether or not they are increased risk or not. That testing um, and providing that result also helps us to know how we can then advise women about the options appropriate to that level of risk with respect to um, managing their breast cancer risk and ovarian cancer risk. If no mutation is found, this is what we term an inconclusive result. And essentially what that means is that we haven't been able to provide an explanation for the family history. It does not mean that family history is not important. It just means that we can't quite get to the bottom of why it's there. And it may be that there is another hereditary reason which science hasn't yet caught up with in being able to fully understand. An inconclusive test result means that there is no test for other family members um, and we cannot um, provide that definite certainty about whether they have or have not um, inherited that cancer risk. However, we can still estimate what an individual family member's cancer risk might be and provide recommendations about cancer screening based on the family history itself. Genetic testing can also be conducted in the private sector. And essentially what this means is that people can self-fund a genetic test themselves. This can be done with the assistance of a familial cancer centre or via a GP or other health professional, but it does involve a cost to the patient of which there is no reimbursement from Medicare or a private health insurer. The cost is approximately $2,500 to do a test for a BRCA1 and a BRCA2 gene. And there are some um, issues in regards to interpreting the results when done in this session. So it is important to sort of be aware of what the test can and cannot do um, when we do testing in this session. So where is the picture of genetic testing of breast cancer going? As we've explained before, the BRCA1 and 2 genes do explain some family histories of breast cancer, but not all. And our understanding about all of the inherited factors that contribute to breast cancer risk um, is still ongoing. We do know that there are um, moderate breast cancer risk genes of which we are beginning to learn more about. And these are called variants. Each of us have a lot of vari variations within our genetic information. Some of them may have no effects in themselves, um, however others may have a very small effect on our health. What we're beginning to understand is that for some individuals, they may carry a high number of what we call low-risk variations in terms of the spelling of our genetic makeup. And in a particular combination, in terms of having a high number of variations, when those variations come together, they may in themselves cause a significantly increased risk for a woman's breast cancer. So it is unlikely that we will have more single genes that we can test for, like the RCA1 or 2, that would explain some family histories of breast cancer, and more likely that we are um, that the explanation for family histories that we currently are unable to explain is much more complex and may involve a number of genes that we inherit together. So importantly, what can you do in terms of um, controlling and also managing your breast cancer risk? For a woman who has a low or moderate risk of breast cancer um, or even high risk of breast cancer, the way in which we live our lifestyle can be incredibly important to our breast cancer risk. The more we understand, um, the more research that is done, the more we understand how important things like taking regular exercise, maintaining a healthy weight and diet, 
and also minimising our alcohol intake is important not only from a breast cancer risk but also from our general health perspective. So women at any level of risk, breast cancer, uh, breast awareness is, is incredibly important. I think it's important to say that we don't want women to be able to diagnose breast cancer through self-examination. What we want them to do is to understand how to become familiar with the normal look and feel of their breast. So that if there is a change in their breast, that they'll be able to um, see that that has occurred. Um, and most importantly, that they'll seek medical advice for further assessment. If women are aged between 50 and 69, we would strongly encourage them to participate in the breast screening program. Women are invited to the program from 50 and can access an anagram every two years. It's important for women to be educated about their breast cancer risk as well as the options available in terms of managing those risks. So if you're unsure, speak to your GP or get some information. And one of the best ways to get the information is through contacting the Cancer Council of Victoria. Keeping up to date about all the things you can do to cut not only breast cancer risk but your general cancer risk is important. And there are some great links on the Cancer Council website for this. Good evening everyone, this is Carol Abbott, I'm the Senior Cancer Nurse with the Cancer Council Helpline and I'd also like to welcome you all for attending this evening. I think one of the main messages that we are trying to get across tonight is whether or not there is cancer in your family, uh, it's so important to know how to get reliable information about not only breast cancer awareness but how to minimise your cancer risk for other types of cancers as well. There are a number of ways that you can access information if you're concerned about your, your cancer risk. One way of doing that is through your general practitioner. Or you could actually call the Cancer Council Helpline on 13 11 20. We provide general information on cancer risk and can help you to formulate questions that you might like to ask the doctor about. Please also be aware that uh, after the webinar today, if any of your one in your family is diagnosed with breast or ovarian cancer, you may need to put seek further information or advice on what's been provided to you tonight. It's very important to get information tailored to your own situation so you can actually avoid any of the harms that too many unnecessary tests or, uh, may, may actually cause. On the website uh, that we mentioned on the last slide, which was the cut your cancer list, this is an excellent way to get information on all cancers. Um, this webinar is a good way to think about prevention and know that actually we think about 30% of these cancers may be able to be prevented with information that we provide on this website. The Cancer Australia website has some excellent information that uh, it includes a calculator tool which helps you to uh, to uh, uh, calculate your, your cancer risk. And also it has an excellent section on breast awareness. One of the sites which you can go to here that will be uh, provided to you on email tomorrow is a website called the Chichi Checkup. It's a site which has been specifically designed for younger women wanting to know about breast awareness and breast health. They actually also have on the website a, a list of Facebook where you can actually get prompts um, to remind you, and also friends if you wish about your breast cancer uh, checkup. There are a number of familiar cancer centers as you can see on the screen, uh, which, which incorporate the whole of metropolitan and Melbourne. And those in um, other states can actually call the Cancer Council Helpline to find out where the nearest familiar cancer clinic is to you. So I think one of the key take-home messages um, for people listening in tonight, I think the one message that we really want to get across is that for most women, having a family history of breast cancer will not in itself significantly increase their breast cancer risk. So don't panic. Genetic testing is complex and it isn't always the answer um, that, that is best in terms of taking women to understand and or manage their breast cancer risk. For women at normal risk, in that they may not have an elevated risk of breast cancer above that of any other woman in the community, lifestyle changes may be important in reducing and managing the breast, uh, reducing the breast cancer risk, um, but also other cancer risks as well. Be body and breast aware, 
and please don't hesitate to contact your doctor or the cancer council if you've got any questions or concerns. Thank you very much, ladies. I certainly feel a lot more informed. Um, we're now going to move on to your questions. So our wonderful audience has put forward um, many questions. Uh, some of them are very specific and obviously tailored to their individual situation. We've pulled out um, a few that we think will help the majority, but again, as uh, Carol pointed out and Wilkinda also highlighted, those with individual questions, we have links to other support services um, that are available for you to uh, uh, access uh, following this webinar. So Carol and Lucinda are going to work together on this um, section. The questions will be listed online so you can see them and the uh, girls will go through them um, now. So the first question is to the Lucinda. Uh, it comes from Monica in Western Australia. Uh, I have had breast and ovarian cancer. I had the genetic test, which showed I did not have the BRCA gene. Is this common, Lucinda? And should I worry about the chances of my daughter or granddaughters contracting either cancers? And also she asks, um, should I suggest that my daughter has the genetic test, given that I did not carry the gene myself? It is common to have this. BRCA gene test result, and that's because we don't know all the hereditary explanations for family history such as yours. This doesn't, however, mean that there isn't a hereditary explanation, and it is important to remember that the family history may be important in informing your relative, including your daughter's risk. What I would suggest is that your daughter make contact with the genetic service that you've been in contact with to be able to provide specific advice based on your results and family history. And we have another question, um, this time from South Australia, from Anne. Should I be having testing done to see if I'm at risk as my mum um, and my great aunt and five of my mum's cousins have all had breast cancer? And the family history of cancer, as you describe, describe it, could indicate the presence of a hereditary breast cancer gene. The first step would really be to investigate this further by seeing your GP and or seeking a referral to the Family Cancer Centre. A Family Cancer Centre can help guide you through the process of gathering your relevant family history information, and that's the most helpful tool for a family cancer service to best assess your breast cancer risk and your family's eligibility for genetic testing, and most importantly, what you can do to manage a breast cancer should it be in place. Next question is from Victoria from Jeff. I had a scare at 38. Now my mum is going through breast cancer. How do I find information on testing? My breast surgeon also said that he would now take my mum out due to the fact that my mother had breast cancer. But why I act now when I wanted it out two years ago? Jeff, I can't comment on why the breast surgeon has provided this advice to you now. And I think the best advice I can give you is to inquire directly with him as to why he's giving you that advice and the basis for that. As for your family history and the question about what that means for you and whether you're eligible for testing, you could ask your GP or breast surgeon to refer you to a family cancer service or make contact directly with a family cancer centre who again can guide you through the assessment process. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about that question is you was about cancer scare. That's okay. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Or? Um, many women can have a scare in that they may either have a lump that they find or they have a mammogram um, and there is something on that image itself which the breast cancer, the breast surgeon may be unsure as to what the nature of that is. Many women who have a scare, um, it, it often turns out to be nothing, but it's important to follow through mm -hmm. and, and follow it through properly um, with medical attention and advice to make sure that there really is nothing at all. So you'd be asking uh, people who ask that question to perhaps follow up with the doctor to find out and to find exactly what it's what it's saying in Absolutely. And if anyone's got anything that they're concerned about, don't put it down to the fact that it's nothing. Get it checked out first. The next question is from Pearl from New Zealand. Um, how do you 
how do you do testing when a member of the family may have already passed away? Well, it's a really good question and one unfortunately we can commonly say. It's usually not possible to do genetic testing um, through government funding for families where individuals who have been affected by cancer have passed away and where we don't have a BRCA1 or 2 gene alteration known in those families. There is, however, the option of family members who have been unaffected by cancer self-funding a BRCA1 test, and this is done by a private laboratory testing. A familial cancer service can assist you in informing you about what the test can and cannot tell you, uh, the limitations, the cost, they can arrange the test, and most importantly, interpret that result for you in light of your family history. Could I just mention there too, before we go on to the next question, that anybody who has lost a family member as a result of any cancer, um, it can be a very significant and profound effect, and it's absolutely fine to call the Cancer Cancer Helpline and speak with an experienced cancer nurse about your experience. We're asking from the line to five Monday to Friday, and the number is 13 in the center. Our next question comes from Catherine in Tasmania. What is the difference between the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 gene and the chance of passing the genome if, I'm assuming it means, if you have no family history? Um, Catherine, to me, it's felt like there are a few parts to this question, so I'm going to break it down and answer it how I think it intended to ask the question. Um, firstly, the chance of having a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation when there is no family history of relevant cancer is incredibly small. These genes are rare. If, however, there is a BRCA1 or 2 gene of in a family, what we know is that for a person who has a copy of a faulty BRCA gene, they also have a working copy of that gene, and that's because we all have two working copies. Uh, sorry, two copies of stuff. When a person with a faulty gene has a child, they can either pass on their working copy of the BRCA gene or their copy with the fault in it, and it's a 50% chance which one they might pass on. It's a little bit up to the coin. Lastly, in terms of other differences between the BRCA1 and 2 genes, what we understand is that the levels of risk for breast and ovarian cancer do slightly differ between the two genes. But on the whole, the risk is actually still high when compared to the average woman, and our recommendations in with respect to how women manage breast risks are often still the same. Our next question comes from Lily in Richmond in Victoria. What age can my children be genetically tested? If we know that there is a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation in the family, we know that that does not cause a risk of children developing cancer. Therefore, the guidelines are such that we offer genetic testing for BRCA testing to individuals from the age of 18. It is, however, more common for individuals to seek information about genetic testing when it is that that information would change their health care. And coming from Fiona, uh, this is from New South Wales, I have two daughters, aged 23 and 25, and I have breast cancer at 35. Should they seriously consider testing to gauge their risk factors? The age at which you develop breast cancer would increase your daughter's breast cancer risk. In terms of the level of risk, it would be important to more accurately assess your family history. As I've spoken about before, genetic testing happens in a stepwise fashion, and so the best advice I can give you is to seek advice from a family cancer service who can better advise you about your um, daughter's risk as well as family eligibility for testing. Pamela in, uh, in Queensland writes, I'm 22 years old. My nana had breast cancer at 41. My mother had breast cancer at 44. I know my mother was estrogen and progesterone sensitive, but my nana won't talk about her cancer. Two of her sisters had breast cancer, and my grandpa, her husband, had bowel and prostate cancer, but no one will talk about their cancer, so I'm not sure if I should be worried 
all of sugar concentrated. That's a lot in that one today. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't always easy for families to talk about painful events like cancer diagnoses. It's also really common that individuals of older generations aren't used to talking about private, intimate health details with younger generations. That doesn't mean that a family cancer service can't assist you in assessing your family history and sometimes help you to gather the relevant information you need. Um, a family history, if you describe it, is relevant, um, not to thank you, but it certainly would be reasonable to make contact with a service for further advice. And uh, I'd like to highlight here the um, importance of the genetic counselling service. It's not just a service where you can go along and get your breast cancer or ovarian cancer risk determined, but they're actually looking at you as a whole person. So they're actually looking at some of the issues that face many families. And um, I'd be right in being assuming listeners are talking about this mm. and bringing out this issue are very much a part of what you do in your role. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, much of what we do is actually helping to support families dealing with these issues and the emotional ramifications of that. It can sometimes open um, painful past history. Lucy in Adelaide writes, I'm 23 years old. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer 60 years ago at the age of 50. She was treated and is now cancer free. Two years ago, my, uh, by my maternal aunt, uh, I'm assuming for people who don't know that's the father's side, um, was diagnosed and is currently undergoing treatment. With cases of breast cancer on both sides of my family, what steps do I need to take as a young person with the family history? And do I qualify for genetic testing? This is a good question because often people can feel like when a family history of cancer is on both sides that it makes things worse for them. But it is an impact how our genetics work. And we don't actually add family histories of cancer on each side together when we calculate a breast cancer risk. Having a mother with a breast cancer um, at, at age 50 doesn't in itself increase your risk of breast cancer very highly. Um, and it would be unlikely that that would be due to a BRCA gene mutation. I would, however, recommend to speak to GP about your family history, and it is really important to tell your GP about all family members affected by cancer, not just breast cancer, because we look for patterns of cancers in families, of which sometimes there can be variety of types that add together. And am I right in understanding then, is that um, the breast cancer is, is, is worked out on separately for the mother's side and the father's side? Correct. And what we look for is which part of the family is actually causing the highest risk and provide recommendations um, to cover that highest risk, regardless of which part it comes from. And here's a question again from New South Wales from Robin Norbury. My mother has had breast and ovarian cancer. She had a genetic test for the BRCA genes, which came back inconclusive. What does this result mean? And what are the odds of getting both these cancers with the genetic test? This is a little bit like the first question in that um, an inconclusive result means we haven't been able to explain the family history via the BRCA gene result in that we haven't got a BRCA gene mutation. Um, and that's because, again, it is most likely that the family history is caused by something else. It is difficult to estimate what your odds are of developing those cancers without full knowledge of your family history. And I would suggest you make contact with the genetic service that your family has been in contact with previously to further advice. Finally, a question from Sandra in Perth. It's been suggested to me that I have a gene test. I don't think it will change how I manage having an annual mam mammogram. Um, and a regular self check. I have a daughter, and perhaps I should, and maybe I should for her sake have the testing. Um, just to clarify the two, I see that she said annual mammogram. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, Carol, sometimes gen tests can change what people have been doing in terms of their um, follow up, but sometimes it doesn't change the, um, what is recommended for them. Having a family history assessed is the best way we can inform you about whether what you're doing is, is all that you need to do or whether there are additional breast tests and or options in regards to managing your risk. 
being motivated to explore a family history because of the implications for children is really common. And equally, if your daughter um, wanted to contact a centre herself for advice, if you didn't want to be involved, that would be fine too. Brilliant. Well, that concludes the uh, pre-submitted questions and answer section. Thank you, Carol and Lucinda. That was brilliant. Um, we all found that very informative at our end, and we hope you did at home as well. We've had many questions being asked this evening, um, and we are trying to get to them all via uh, the chat or, or the private Q&A section that some people are utilising, uh, but we will um, have to wait and address other queries over the next few days because some of them are very um, specific to the individual um, or the individual family history. Uh, please note that we will endeavour to add these um, and they will be available um, online um, in our uh, uh, in our sorry in our frequently asked questions section um, in the next few days as we can as we can uh, manage them. Um, so we've decided as a group now that we won't answer any other individual questions. We do really encourage you, we've got had quite a few questions coming through that um, we actually have covered in the webinar. So when this is available online, which it should be um, given the IT gods are with us by the end of the week, uh, you will be able to watch this back and hopefully you'll have your individual uh, question answered there as well. Um, in terms of support moving forward, um, an email will be sent with some fact sheets that might be helpful tomorrow, as well as some um, resources. A recording of this webcast will be available on the Cancer Council Victoria homepage, hopefully by the end of the week. As I mentioned, and uh, Carol's highlighted, um, Carol is one of our lovely nurses on the uh, health line in Victoria. So if you thought she sounded okay and sounded like she knew what she was doing, um, she is one of our most experienced cancer nurses, so we do encourage you to call 13 11 20, and that will connect you to your um, local helpline service. Uh, the cancer support pages um, on the cancer individual uh, cancer council website will also fetch you more specific questions we didn't have time to cover all tonight. So, that's about it. Um, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's session um, and found it very informative. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we had participants from Bundaberg to Alice Springs, Tasmania, New Zealand, and even one from New York. Um, we hope it's been useful in alleviating some of your anxieties and concerns about genetic testing and empowers you to make a more informed decision about your health and the health of your family moving forward. We'd really appreciate it if you could take two minutes to uh, complete the evaluation that will be sent to you shortly via email and let us know your thoughts so we can improve and refine these sessions. So that would be much appreciated while you're finishing off your cuppa. I would like to say a very special thank you to Lucinda Hossack who stepped in in the final hours and has done a beautiful job. So thank you very much for Lucinda. Also, thank you to Carol and the support team um, for answering all your questions online and over the phone. Uh, we wish you all the very best. Please remember Cancer Council and many of our supporting organisations are here to help, so please do utilise these services in the future. Take care and good night. Mm -hmm.